Uh, when I thought about kind of how to start this discussion, and maybe even to kind of kick off our time together, I thought to myself, there's 104 days of summer vacation, and school comes along this annual. So the annual problem for this generation is finding a good way to spend it. Thank you for spending it at the Spartan Debate Institute. Uh, my name is Will. Yeah. My name is Will, uh, and I guess the key part of what I just mentioned is the word discussion. I do want to lecture about a few things, but it's 2018, and some of the facts and figures that I'm going to throw out are things that if you don't jot them down, every single little word, it's okay. You have the internet, and you can relook up all these items. In fact, there's a pretty thorough glossary at the start of the opening of the affirmative starter pack evidence. And I also want to make sure that you understand not just the tiny details, but some broader concepts. So let's get into it. Uh, it's not a lecture, I already did that, boom. So I do think that you will be much more informed about immigration policy and do better, not just in your debates here, but during the season, if you begin to figure out not just what the immigration laws are, but why it is difficult to change them, and why there would be a big reaction if there was an attempt to do so. Uh, little notes, if you don't know what I'm talking about, we will Almost all of you will have a debate this week, if not several, and you will use a starter pack of evidence. The starter pack of evidence is openly available at that website, which is the main SDI website. And as we discuss this morning immigration <coughs> policy, keep in mind that it is a very electric issue. We want to kind of have respect for everyone's perspective. You don't need to think any one way about it, but um, do keep that in mind as you advance your comments. Okay, I'm going to lead with the following question for you, and I want you to take a moment and jot down your answer. Why does the Congress struggle so hard to change immigration policy? Jot down your answer, I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it. And this, I am going to scoot around on this, because this is great. is provided there, and I think you kind of get what the word comprehensive means. It means changing not just one part of immigration policy, but lots of parts of immigration policy. I guess there's different ways to define the word comprehensive, but the last time the Congress did anything that people could agree was comprehensive was in 1986, when it passed the Immigration Control and Reform Act. And the fact that the word control and reform are in the same sentence implies that it was a compromise between people that are more hardline and restrictionist on immigration and people who are more open to admitting more immigrants or softening certain enforcement efforts. 1986 was a long time ago, um, even by Tim Mahoney standards, and so that is kind of the setup for how difficult it is for Congress to do anything big on immigration. Now, I'm going to go here and give a few more facts and figures. The opposite of a comprehensive approach is what's called a clean, and it has nothing to do with 
being dirty in any case, but <coughs> clean or standalone reform, where you don't try to fix every aspect of immigration policy at once, but you instead try to have one singular or standalone item that you address. Even this has proven difficult. In fact, there's a chance that the Congress might do standalone reform as it relates to the family separation issue that I'm sure all of you have been reading about and learning about. But even with that issue, which is sort of something that overwhelmingly a huge percentage of the American voters would like to see something happen, even that has not yet passed through the Congress. So let's go back to the question that I posed to you. Anyone can raise their hand. I'll take a few different answers. I don't think any answers will be wrong. Why do you find it so difficult for Congress to do something on immigration? All right, in the back in the green, go ahead. Um, What's your name? Eric Gregor. Eric, and you're from? Kansas City. Kansas City. What's your answer? Um, it's politically costly, incredibly controversial, and this takes too long to get out of the Okay, so his answers, if you couldn't hear, were it's incredibly controversial, difficult to find a compliment. Anyone with a different kind of twist on an answer? Also in the back, Black here, go ahead. different parties on this issue. Because while factually there are Democrats and Republicans, there's not unity amongst the Democrats and the Republicans about how to handle any issue. Right here in the green. Go ahead. Your name? Melanie from GBS. A little bit louder if you could, Melanie. Ooh, so an interesting twist that Melanie makes is that many members of Congress don't have a whole bunch of immigrants or pro-immigrant communities in their district, so it may not be a re-election issue for them. Anyone else have something that they really, really want to get in? Okay, over here. Go ahead. Your name? Maya. Maya from? Maya. From Florida. Go ahead. So it's a moral and rights like debate as well as a safety and security, so it's Okay, so Maya has said it's a moral issue, but it's also a disagreement with people that are in favor of safety and security. Okay, all these are good starts at what I would like to get at. And I actually don't disagree with anything that anyone said, but I think it's even more complicated on that. And the point that I want you to kind of understand is that even when the parties agree, they still can't ultimately find a way to pass a standalone law. All right. So, generally speaking, I think we can all agree that parents have annoying moments, okay? And I want to talk about a specifically annoying parenting phenomenon. Suppose, hypothetically, that you and your parents are on the exact same page on a question. You go to your parents and you say, hey, I would like to go to debate camp, all right? Sometimes you almost want to keep that secret from your parents because once they figure out that you like something, it immediately becomes leverage for them to get you to do a whole bunch of stuff that you otherwise do not want to do. Raise your hand if this is a familiar phenomenon to you. Okay, so, of course when you go and you talk to your parents and you say, hey, I like debate, I would like to go to debate camp, one thing that runs through their mind is, okay, spending a few weeks at debate camp is better than eating Tide Pods, like my child should have worse habits, okay? But the other thing that runs through their head is, light bulb, ooh, 
My child likes to bathe, clearly wants to do this, and I have leverage in this situation. That same exact phenomenon isn't just the golden rule for parenting. It's the golden rule for Congress as it relates to immigration issues. Because even if both sides agree that something should be done about family separation, even if both sides agree that something should be done for the dreamers, who are a group of students who have been here since the earliest portions of their childhood, it's always a calculation as to which side wants this more. And people are afraid in Congress to give the other side something for free. Go ahead, what's your name? Louder. Okay, so I'm going to correct a few words that you said. You said Democrats are more in favor of restrictive immigration policy. I want to correct that. I do think most people think that the Democrats are in favor of less restrictive immigration policy. I agree with you that most, not all, Republicans are in favor of a slightly more restrictive approach, including border security. But trading the two for one another, like they did in 1986, is very, very difficult to do. Because when these trades come around, you not only trade something for family separation, which everyone wants, and Democratic voters want an awful lot, according to polling, you instead try to trade it for something that the populace might not like as much. The voters might not like as much, okay? Think about the chore that you dislike the most. As your parents identify that you definitely, definitely really want to go to debate camp, okay? They start to consider using that as leverage to get you to do something that you might not otherwise want to compromise on. And to get standalone, can we just talk about just the debate camp issue, is a conversation that your parents don't want to have, even if they kind of want you to go to debate camp, because they really want you to take out the trash, and you never take out the trash, what is your problem? Okay, other comments? Go ahead, right here. What's your name? Uh, Nolan. Nolan. Where are you from, Nolan? Rockford. Rockford. Loud. Uh, is there any, like, congressional equivalent within, like, the past decade of, like, one side, like, throwing a slow pitch or throwing the other side a bell, or does that not happen? So the question that Nolan asks is, has there ever been, uh, like, mild compromise? Is that what you're saying? Well, like, one, one side is, like, a, yeah, we'll, we'll compromise with you on this. So it depends what you mean by examples of that. For instance, the DREAM Act is sponsored by Democrats and Republicans. So there are certain people that are really willing to work. But it's very, very hard to get that across the finish line because people want to trade solutions for the DREAM Act population for less popular initiatives. And we'll get into the mathematical details of that in a second. Go ahead, here. Um, Loud. So, so um, are you basically saying that like, congressmen and women are trying to <coughs> get like, as equal of a deal as possible? Like, If Republicans want something but Democrats want it a lot more, then Republicans are going to say, well, you want this more than us, so we want something else so that we want it just as much as you. So the question is, am I saying that members of Congress kind of want an equal deal. And I guess I would go, a little bit depends on one's perspective, but I actually think that both sides are trying really hard to get the other party to pass something that they really don't like, okay? It's like your parents. They're not just trading debate camp for a chore that you kind of otherwise would do. They're trading it for something that you really don't like to do. And that dynamic makes it very hard for the Congress to pass anything on immigration. Even the easiest, most sort of agreeable initiatives that Republican and Democratic voters all kind of concur upon. And every, a lot of American voters agree on the family separation issue. And even that has not yet passed the Congress. 
We'll see if it does. So, here's just some polling that might bring into perspective all of the different issues that exist and how popular they are. DACA, which I think you know a little bit about, but I'll talk about a lot. 86% of voters would like something done to protect immigrants that are not, you know, undocumented communities that arrived when they were children, all right? But only 37%, according to this poll, would like something to be done about the wall. To go back to the parent analogy, even though a lot of people want this, okay, some of the people that want this insist upon giving in on this only if there's a trade for something that is less popular. And that trade makes it really hard for anyone to agree on a compromise, which is why compromises in Congress are incredibly, incredibly rare. You don't need to write down that chart. The mathematical portions of it aren't that significant. Here are some statistics about family separation. And I encourage you, when you do your research, not just to look at how popular an immigration policy is, but to look at how popular it is amongst the different voters from different parties. So, while the family separation issue is overwhelmingly popular, and someone, you know, most voters oppose family separation, there is a small degree of support amongst Republican voters, which means that it's hard, if you're a Republican member of Congress, to just have a standalone solution to the family separation issue. It would be easier for you to sell that to the people that are going to vote for you if you could trade it for another item. But the item that you may want to trade it for, cutting legal immigration, building the wall, might be something that the Democratic voters could never support, and hence members of the Democratic Party would have a tough time voting for it. That's why there's a stalemate. Go ahead. Could, Loud. Could they vote, like, could they trade something that is outside, like, could they trade immigration for, like, guns or something? Okay, it's a weird concept for a trade. Yeah, uh, the question was, can immigration be traded for other issues? And the answer is yes, okay. Um, and that kind of happens all the time. You hear about these weird stories where they really need the senator from Alaska to vote for something, so they you know, build a bridge for the senator in Alaska or something like that. Um, but that kind of happens more on the DL, if that makes sense, you know what I mean? Um, it would be tough to just throw that into an Immigration Reform Act, if that makes sense. Okay, great question. All right, let's keep going. The DREAM Act, if you don't understand it yet, that's totally fine. But this math may be of interest to you. The DREAM Act is a very interesting issue where both Republicans and Democrats support it. And in fact, I would argue both of them overwhelmingly support it. Now, given that polling, it is amazing that the DREAM Act has been before the Congress since 2001. And 17 years later, your entire lives, it is still not passed, even though the majority of Republican and Democratic voters are in favor of it. Here is one of the reasons why. When Maggie talks about a wedge issue, the defining wedge issue is the campaign promise that Donald Trump made to build a wall along the southern border. Some, although not all, Republicans support that. Most Democrats oppose it, like overwhelmingly. Yet, when any immigration solution comes up, there is a trade that is offered which says, I will do this in exchange for building the wall. The Democrats then don't agree on that. We don't get anywhere. I should make a note on polling. Not all polls agree on these statistics. I tried to find a poll that was generally speaking, regarded as fairly moderate and not favoring one side or the other. But you could find different polls for all this, including polls which say that the border wall is popular. So, now we move to question number two. And I want you to be able to exit this discussion this morning knowing the differences between DACA, which is another 
one of these alphabet soup acronyms and the DREAM Act. But of course, you might not be totally familiar with them. So here are just some important notes that help you understand DACA. You can jot them down. Note that I kind of bolded and italicized the word deferred, which is the first word in DACA. And I'll elaborate on that more in a moment. But that's a very important concept to understand. Of the roughly 11 million unauthorized persons in the United States, about 1.8 arrived prior to turning 16 years old. And I want to be clear that many of them are not under the age of 16 anymore. And in fact, some of the laws that the affirmative will defend will defend people who arrived prior to the age of 16, but could be in their 30s now. So that kind of distinction is important. And I think the last bullet point makes sense. Let's not hand up. We're good? OK. Continuing. So one difference to understand is that the dreamers, and the word phrase dreamer, is actually comes from the Dream Act which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. But the dreamers are a larger group of people than the people who currently are under DACA. If you are under DACA, you are not going to be deported in all likelihood in the status quo, current system of affairs, but you don't have permanent residency and your status could change, so it's kind of shaky ground. Okay. In addition to the 1.8 million people who arrived before their 16th birthday, there's an additional 1.8 million people who arrived at either age 17 or 18, and again, some of them are over the age of 18 now. The DREAM Act, which is what the affirmative will be defending in your starter pack debates, would cover all 3.6 million of those people. Everyone that arrived before the age of 18 up until their early 30s. I'm going to pause here. Does anyone have any questions about DACA, DREAM Act? Go ahead, Noam. Can you be under both by chance? Can you be? Yeah, can you be affected by both? Yeah. Of course, anyone that arrived at age 17, excuse me, uh, before the age of 16, right, would be eligible to sign up for DACA, and if the DREAM Act passed, would also be eligible to have a pathway to permanent citizenship. Okay. Go ahead. Loud. What is like the difference between the people that are eligible for DACA versus the DREAM Act? So what are the differences between the people who are eligible for DACA and the DREAM Act? Great question. All right. First of all, the DREAM Act does not exist now. Okay? So the biggest difference between the two is that DACA does exist now, all right, and the DREAM Act doesn't. The second big difference is that the DREAM Act would cover people that arrived at age 17 and 18, which sounds like a small difference, but it's another 1.8 million people. Okay? So that's a big difference. All right? And then the biggest difference between the DREAM Act and DACA is that the DACA solution is extraordinarily temporary. In fact, the Trump administration has attempted to cancel it. The DREAM Act would provide a more permanent solution, not just for the people who are protected under DACA, but for the people that arrived at age 17 and 18. So it would provide a more permanent opportunity for 3.6 million people. That's the biggest difference. Okay. We're moving. What is the DREAM Act? It's another one of these weird acronyms. Don't feel weird if you didn't know what it stood for. Uh, I did a ton of research on it. I didn't know what it stood for at first either. Okay? Um, but that's what it stands for. As an aside, like, if you want a weird job when you grow up, like you could take any piece of legislation and come up with like a funky acronym and like there's this whole appetite in the Congress to come up with like cute acronyms for whatever law passes. None of them really 
are as important as the content of what the law would say. All right? And the DREAM Act is designed, as you mentioned before, to protect all of the DREAMers, including the DACA recipients. As I mentioned before, the DREAM Act's been around since 2001. It's failed many times in the Congress. When you do your research, please know that the affirmative in the packet is discussing the DREAM Act of 2017, which is the most recent version that has been put forth in the United States Senate. Question over here, I thought. Okay. Good. So this really isn't enough detail. You need to be able in cross-examination or in your discussions to kind of explain what the DREAM Act would do. Okay? And here are some of the eligibility criteria for the DREAM Act. Contrary to common belief, if the DREAM Act passed tomorrow, not everyone who is undocumented would just immediately become a citizen. It creates what's called a pathway to citizenship. And you can't get on the pathway unless you meet certain criteria. You have to come before the age 18. <laughs> you have to have been physically present in the United States for four years before the DREAM Act passes. Which means there are people right now that are hoping that the DREAM Act will pass that don't go on vacation overseas because they would lose out on the physically present, present argument that could be part of the DREAM Act if it were to pass. Yes. And even that's not enough. You need to either demonstrate that you have a degree from higher education, that you intend to seek a degree for higher education, or you meet certain employment requirements. More detail on that. So some of these people are very, very young. They haven't entered, co in, entered college yet at all. So if they're enrolled in a school, that cuts it. If you're older, 18 or older, then you either need to have been admitted to a college, have a high school diploma, or you're in the process of getting one. I'll give you one more second if you want to jump back in. All the way. It's going to make it. You can do it. There it is. All right. I got it. I'll leave it up here. Does anyone know another way that you can be eligible despite the education requirements for the DREAM Act? Go ahead. Service in the United States military. And here's the detail and breakdown of that. The argument that the affirmative will make is because the DREAM Act allows you to either gain a pathway to citizenship through an edu higher education requirement or the military, then more people might sign up for the United States military. And then the affirmative will say that that's good. The negative will say that that's bad. There are certain requirements that relate to having a job or having held a job. These are most relevant to the older dreamers who maybe arrived when they were under the age of 18, but that might have been a long time for them. So in some versions of the DREAM Act, they can say, hey, look, I've held a job for a decade. The idea behind the DREAM Act is that there are a lot of people who arrived in the United States before they had any real say in their own travel. They're not open rule breakers. And if they lived in the United States and either gone to school or served in the military or had other modes of employment, they might have a more persuasive case across the political perspective to be allowed to not be deported. That is sort of the argument and the logic behind some of the Dream Act. So here are the differences. We spoke about this question before, and I want you to be able in, when you go to lab later today, kind of understand the big 
differences between the DREAM Act and DACA. And I'll talk about DACA a little bit more in a second, because I kind of rushed through that a little bit. The biggest difference is the first one. One is the law, at least right now. The other one is not the law until the affirmative comes along. A permanent solution. And DACA really doesn't deal with the entire broader category of dreamers. Okay, here's the next question for you. What happens... When people really want change, but the Congress just won't pass immigration policy, like the Dream Act. Except I'm going to give you 15, 30 seconds, write out your answer. If you want immigration policy to change, and it just is not going to change, what are some other options that you could consider? Take a moment. share one of their answers or thoughts. Way in the corner. Go ahead. Loud. So you could pass it through another process, through executive order, which is a 10 cent way of having the president said, pass it. Go ahead. You could try to go through the other branch, which is to wind it through the court system. Anything else? Go ahead, Nolan. Maybe like individuals just kind of go on strike and refuse to enforce Nolan is down for just mass protest strategy. Okay, go ahead. Over here. Stage a coup. Uh, stage a coup, all right. Kind of Nolan plus. Yeah. Loud. State governments can do certain things. Okay, anyone else with an idea in the back of the blue? Loud. Vote them out of office. Go ahead. What's the same thing? Vote them out of office. Love it. All right. Last one here. Loud. Elections. All right. Okay. So, great answers that have come across. I'm going to talk about a couple of those options and how they've played out in the real world. Sometimes you need to pull an end around Congress because Congress isn't going to do very much on immigration policy. And I'm really harping on that point because it's not just relevant to the starter pack. Like, it is going to be very difficult for the Congress to do very much on immigration anytime soon. Sometimes you go through the court system. Obviously, Maggie already discussed how the travel restrictions of the Trump administration were challenged in court. That was a crazy legal winding road where the Trump administration lost on the federal court level, and then one in the United States Supreme Court. And two things called DACA and DAPA, and it's okay if you don't know what DAPA is either, they were challenged in court, and they've had different outcomes, and that's pretty wild. Sometimes the president can do something on their own. And I want to draw an analogy that I read about that helped this make sense to me. Maybe it will make sense to you. Every law enforcement officer has choices. They have discretion. If you were a police officer or a principal and the following two things were happening at once, someone was going one mile an hour over the speed limit and at the same time you got a call that there was an emergency on the other side of town that was life-threatening, you could use your discretion to either arrest and detain the person that was one mile over the speed limit, or give them a ticket, or you could rush over to the emergency on the other side of town. The President of the United States has similar 
authority to make discretionary decisions. President Obama in 2012 really, really, really wanted Congress to do something about the Dreamers. And it was very frustrating to President Obama, I can say that without having spoken to him, all right, that both Republicans and Democrats wanted to agree, but they couldn't agree. So, in 2012, he said, we are just going to defer and use our judgment, and we are going to say that with all of the things that immigration officials need to do, they're never going to choose to prosecute the Dreamers, who are people who've been here since they were age three, all right? And instead, they're going to prioritize other immigration issues. So he deferred enforcement to a specific population, and that deferral became known as DACA. Now that angered a whole bunch of Republicans. They're like, you can't do that. It's our job to pass immigration law. And he said, I'm not passing immigration law. I'm using my discretion. The laws are the same. I'm just deferring action for this 1.8 million people. Here's a little more detail on that. In June of 2012, the president, the passed using his discretion a policy which said <coughs> every two years you need to come and re-sign up but if you meet certain requirements you will be allowed to work in the United States and you won't be at risk for deportation. You'll notice that 800,000 people signed up why do you think 1.8 million people didn't sign up? Why do you think that not everyone who's eligible for DACA has signed up for DACA? Go ahead, Lauer. Because uh, when Trump came into office, he said he was going to leave So, if, argument number one was, even in 2012, some undocumented communities were afraid to give their name to the government because they were afraid they'd wind up on a list where they could be prone to kind of future deportation. And what's your name? Ashley. And Ashley's right that that's even become more of an issue when Trump won. If Hillary Clinton had won, I think people wouldn't have been as nervous about that. But there are some undocumented communities that kind of don't want to present their information to the government because there are trust issues that exist there. Does anyone have a different answer to that question? I think that's, I think actually kind of hit the answer. All right, this number is weird too. 800 million people have signed up, but only now about 100,000 fewer people have renewed because of the same fear that Ashley just discussed. There is a concern about going in and renewing DACA because ultimately that information kind of reveals your undocumented status. So what is this DAPA that you think about? Well, President Obama in 2012 was like, wow, this kind of worked. I got 1.8 million people in theory the opportunity not to be deported. But they are DACA, with the C standing for childhood. So I'm going to try to do the same thing for parents. So deferred action for parents of immigrants was also proposed by Obama. This did not defer action just for young people who had arrived here when they were well under the age of 16, it also deferred it for their parents. And people got really angry about this because it's not just the community that people think is kind of politically understandable to defer action on. It's also a broader set of people. So this went to court. It did not go as well in court. And DAPA ultimately lost in court. That is relevant, not because you'll be debating about DAPA, but because some of the arguments that were used to shoot down DAPA are now coming up in court again in an effort to try to strike down DACA. And so all of that is kind of important, 
And as in T's here, there's a very deep legal, confusing breakdown of the path of DAPA and how it wound through the courts. Apparently I left the blank page. Okay, here we go. How cute is that kid? He's amazing. Trust me. All right. Raise your hand if you have lived in more than one U.S. state in your life. Okay. Look around. Leave your hand up. Look around. Okay. I mean, that's an amazing percentage of the room. Okay. Now, if you are, put your hand up. If you are comfortable doing so, and I'll say that again, if you are comfortable doing so, raise your hand if you have lived in more than one country in your life. So, as we now move away from what is DACA and what is the DREAM Act, that question is posed in advantage one for the affirmative that it is ethical to pass the DREAM Act. Because a lot more people in this country can identify with the concept of moving to a new state when you are under the age of 18 then they can sometimes identify with the idea of moving between countries at the age of 18. And yet, imagine if the state of Missouri said, you're not allowed to be here uh, unless you were born in the state of Missouri. That idea sets up the affirmative argument that it is ethical and appropriate to allow people who are under the age of 18 to be granted a pathway to citizenship if they arrived here before they had any say in how they would move. Almost everyone that raised their hand had very little say in whether or not they transitioned between states or whether or not they transitioned between countries. I'm sure there are some exceptions, but by and large, it is something that is done outside the realm of one's control. And one of the authors in the 1AC, Whitworth, uses that precise example as a device to help be persuasive to an audience that maybe you should consider the differences within states as sort of similar to the kinds of decisions that face the DACA community between countries, especially since they weren't the ones that kind of made the ultimate decision to move. The other advantages in the starter pack are an economy advantage and a military advantage. And the next question I pose to you is, why might admitting 3.6 million dreamers help the United States economy? Go ahead, Ray. Uh, well, Loud. You have more, you want more people to, to, um, like to, to bring money into the economy. You have more... More workers. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Ray. Right Okay, so that, that is the difference between these two answers, okay? Okay, so I agree that more workers could be good for the economy, but one thing that is by and large different about the dreamers is they have certain high education requirements. Many of them have worked already in the United States for years. So there is an argument that the affirmative will make that admitting 3.6 million dreamers will help the economy because the dreamers are very, very likely to have higher educational standards and the evidence demonstrates that they are much more likely to create jobs, have big inventions, big breakthroughs, etc. Now the negative can contest all of that and the negative does. The negative says it's overrated that not all of the dreamers are going to magically invent the next Silicon Valley or huge tech breakthrough. That's the argument that goes back and forth. The military advantage, I don't think, needs a lot of explanation. In the glossary, there is a breakdown of what the word readiness means. But in short, it is very, very difficult for the United States military to have all of the members of the military that they would like, especially since the experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, recruitment has proven more difficult. If you could get tens of thousands of dreamers to fulfill their educational requirement by signing up for the United States military, the affirmative could argue that that would help the United States military. And just like the economy advantage, 
the negative can question whether or not the United States military needs that help or whether or not that would be enough help to kind of give a boost to the U.S. military. Question here in the black. For people to join the military. Loud. Uh, for people to join the military. Yeah. Get in here, would they get GI Bill? So anyone who qualifies for the DREAM Act qualifies for what's called federal benefits. Okay? So yes, okay, but also, all right, a lot of other federal benefits could come even if you didn't serve in the United States military. So for instance, maybe you could get federal medical benefits if you signed up to go to college and fulfilled the eligibility requirement in that manner. Okay, in the back, yeah. Yes. It would look like the eligibility criteria that I signed up. So um, tell me if I'm not answering your question. You would need to be able to document, if you were a dreamer, that you either were signed up to be in the United States military, that you were in an institute of higher education, or if you were under the age of 18, that you were attending school, okay? And there's a couple other weird stipulations like you're working to get your diploma, a GED is like an equivalent to a high school diploma, or that you could fulfill certain employment demonstrations. Yeah. Yeah. And what would it look like in terms of the Ah, okay. So there's a huge breakdown of that. But basically it would take about 11 years, but the most immediate benefit is that you definitely wouldn't be deported. Okay? All right? And that's not so clear under DACA right now. Because DACA could maybe be canceled. All right? Maybe I need to back this up a little bit, but the Trump administration announced on September 5th, 2017, I'll say that again. The Trump administration announced on September 5th, 2017, that they intended to cancel DACA. And the only reason that DACA is not canceled right now is because undocumented communities and their legal advocates are winning in court. Okay? But if they were to lose in the United States Supreme Court, then everyone who signed up for DACA would be immediately eligible for deportation. If the DREAM Act passed, regardless of what happened in the courts, the DREAM Act would say, you are not going to be deported, and over the next 7 to 11 years, you need to do some things and maybe you could become a United States citizen. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Go ahead. So if the DREAM Act only applies to people who have been president of the U.S. for four years before... Physically president. Yeah, not just mentally. Yeah. Um, so, going forward, are you asking if someone... Yeah, so there's a huge debate about that. Keep in mind, there's different conceptions of the DREAM Act. All right, but I, most people say that the compromise could only be pulled off if it was sort of like a one-time amnesty going forward. Obviously, the Democrats would like a version of it that would kind of provide protections going forward. In the real world, I can't imagine that we would start deporting three-year-olds after we pass the DREAM Act. If that makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead. If the DREAM Act were passed, yeah. All right, yeah. if the DREAM Act were passed, yeah. would DACA itself fade away? Or so that's an awesome question. The question on the table is, would DACA fade away if the DREAM Act passed? Um, technically, no. Legally, yes. So all of these court cases that are going through the court system determining is DACA fair, was it unfair, etc., they would all be irrelevant, okay? Because the Congress would have stepped in and said, everyone that is eligible under DACA is now covered under the Dream Act, all right? Technically, there might be some legal issues that would still persist. But the short answer is the DACA controversy would be largely resolved, which is one of the reasons that uh, a lot of Americans kind of like the Dream Act, because they don't really like the threat of deportation for DACA recipients. Yeah, in the back. I, I didn't hear it, sorry. In order to qualify for the Dream Act, yes? Do you have to have both a high school diploma and a college diploma? No, you need to demonstrate that you're enrolled in an institute of higher learning and that you're in good standing, all right? Which means that, like, a typical MSU debater can't sort of just be like, I'm in college. You need to, like, prove it. Does that make sense, all right? You know, and, and actually that, like, as a non-humorous issue is sort of one thing that has freaked out a lot of people who are undocumented who are in higher education, which is like they are under a distinct and unique threat to keep their grades up at a different level because if the DREAM Act were to ever pass, they could lose 
their sort of freedom from deportation if they couldn't demonstrate that they stood, stayed in good standing in an institute of higher education. So that's sort of kind of a weird twist with that. Okay, in the back, I've forgotten your name, but you're from Kansas City. Yeah. yeah. Um, Eric. Eric, right. yeah. All right. Uh, backing up a little, I can get back. Backing up, like first, you got it, go. Uh, the, did DACA apply, instead of apply to parents of DACA, yeah. did it apply to parents of then people born in the United States as well? Um. I am not 100% sure, and I don't like to give answers unless I'm 100% sure, but I think it applied broadly. Someone on the staff can double check me on the breadth of DAPA's thing. DAPA was not popular with Republicans, I'll say that. All right. All right, anything else? Yeah, in the green. Um, you had mentioned how a president can sort of navigate the Congress. If the, the president can try. Can try yeah. They get challenged in court. In, yeah. In So the DREAM Act is permanent law until it's undone. So the trick there would be to either A, have the Congress, the Super Congress, undo it, okay? Or to do some of these weird little things that administrations do to kind of make it difficult. So one thing that the DREAM Act, um, even if it's passed, could struggle with is what if, like, non-eligible, non non-DREAMers that are family members start to get mass supported. Does that make sense? That could reverse the incentives that exist under the DREAM Act, etc. But it would be a big win for immigration rights advocates if the DREAM Act were passed. That would make a significant difference to the threat of deportation. Yeah, go ahead. Um, DACA is just deferred action for people that meet certain criteria, okay? Now, um, Part of, I mean, I guess you might be in better shape if you're enrolled in, like, in theory in higher education, but if you can demonstrate that you were born before a certain date, and it's this crazy thing that's called, you know, like, I think it's called you're in good moral standing, then you're not supposed to get deported under DACA. So then yeah. I think that's a small difference in, in the, yes, but I actually think the bigger argument is just, more people would be more comfortable um, coming out as undocumented and then it would just generally speaking create a positive incentive for staying in the United States. Yeah? It's like good moral character, some crazy plus like that. Yeah. Yeah. So until you're a permanent citizen, you're not protected from deportation. And that's a true for all immigration law. All right, so if you were to commit like a really, like a felony, and you were protected under DACA, or you had like legal permanent residence, which is what Maggie talked about earlier, you're still eligible for deportation. So if you were in high school, and, yeah. and you went to college, and you just didn't get a certificate grade, you were out of the That's not a felony to get bad grades, or else all of us would be in trouble. Um, but uh, if the DREAM Act passed, and you could not demonstrate that you were enrolled in college, then you would be at risk of deportation if that was the only thing that you used to demonstrate your eligibility under the DREAM Act. Yeah. So, Loud. So if the DREAM Act were passed, yeah. would it be like an automatic process, or would there be like a backlog because of all the people There would be a backlog to demonstrate that you qualify for the DREAM Act, okay? And maybe in the interim, some people would get deported, but I think that the courts, generally speaking, you would have a persuasive case, um, you know, the DREAM Act is now law, and the only reason that I didn't, um, I don't, I didn't sign up yet is because there was like a backlog. Like, I think you'd be in much better shape legally. Am I answering your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Last one right here. So, if the DREAM Act is uh, relatively popular among both parties, Yeah. Well, again, your parents are trying to use it for the chore that you like the least. And so the Republicans had an agreement with the Democrats that was brought to Donald Trump's desk that said more border security. Okay? Now, what does border security mean? Okay? It could mean a wall. It could mean, like, let's, you know, use a, a stronger 
you know, let's have more agents on the border, something like that. That definition of what border security meant turned into a fight. The restrictionists wanted a wall, it fell through. Yeah, so really what's holding it up right now, to be totally honest, is that the Democrats are winning in court, so they're not going to trade the DREAM Act for anything else, because <coughs> right now, the DACA, the DACA recipients aren't being deported, okay? If the United States Supreme Court were to take up that case, and the affirmative argues that they will, and the sort of DACA recipients start to get deported in 2019, you might see the Democrats try to trade if they weren't otherwise cut. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's really complicated. Yeah, great question. All right. All right, um, really quickly, there's some negative arguments in the starter pack. Uh, I encourage you to review them. Um, no matter what side you were on in your first practice debate, it helps to know uh, what the disadvantages are. The first one was sort of teased earlier with the question about the GI Bill. You don't need to know what the GI Bill is. But uh, when people move from being DACA recipients to being eligible on the DREAM Act, they immediately become eligible for federal benefits. And some people that don't like government spending are worried that if 3.6 million more people become eligible for federal benefits, let's say they're eligible for Medicare or something like that, that that will really cause an immediate short-term drain on government spending. The affirmative can obviously answer this by saying that deficits are already pretty bad, but that's sort of the argument. The midterm elections disadvantage, I don't think, requires a ton of explanation. I'll give a little bit of background. This is not, 2018 is not a presidential election year. Those come up every four years. But every other year, 2018, there is an election where some members of Congress face re-election. The affirmative could arguably link to a disadvantage which said that the Republicans would do something very, very popular if they passed the DREAM Act. And the Republicans are in charge of Congress right now. And that might help the Republicans win in the midterm elections. And then the affirmative, the negative argues that it would be bad if the Republicans controlled Congress. And a smart negative would also argue that if the Democrats did well in the midterm elections, that that might be broadly good to help uh, immigrants' rights in general. All right, so that's sort of that argument. There's a complicated, I spelled complicated wrong, um, Supreme Court disadvantage. I'm going to bracket that for the time being. There's a counter plan that the negative could read. If you don't know what a counter plan is, don't freak out. But there's a, the negative could defend retaining DACA on a long-term basis, but not passing the DREAM Act. And there's some arguments. B wrote an argument about how citizenship is dangerous. But you could argue that we should never deport the DACA people, but we shouldn't pass all of the DREAM Act. Okay, Maggie already teased this. I just want to say this quickly. Tonight at 9 p.m., President Trump has announced that he will reveal one of four candidates to be the next Supreme Court nominee. I want to take this one step further than Maggie did and say this is very relevant for immigration policy because the court is split 4-4 on a lot of these issues. And depending on who would win um, that nomination, if that nomination were secured, it could tip the balance on some immigration issues. Uh, and even some of that is relevant to the Supreme Court this at in the starter pack. Question here, Nolan. Uh, is, is there like a quick rundown for all four of these? There's, yes. A, a Google search will reveal the four nominees. Three of them identify as male. One of them identifies as female. Um, and then Donald Trump likes to be a wild card, so for all I know, He'll pick someone not on the list of four, but yesterday he said in an interview that it would be one of the four. I watched him say it on television, so he's probably going to fool me and all of the rest of us in a moment. Yeah. So, um, does a lot of the inheritance be a problem? Shh. Go ahead. Yeah. A lot of the inherency in the affirmative is the question. It does assume that the court is very likely to rule against DACA and that deportation will. Change. Now, when I say the court, I mean the Supreme Court. There's all these differences in these lower courts, and right now, um, the defense of DACA is going well in lower courts, but it could get reversed by the Supreme Court. And the last time the Supreme Court heard DAPA, it was a 4 4. 
So that's sort of very relevant as to who the ninth member of the court will be. Last question, go ahead. 